The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. It still is the land of opportunity just as much as ever. In just a few minutes, in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Mother-in-Law Racket. In a country such as ours, a country populated with over 140 million people, it is not a surprising thing that there are seven and a half million people with fingerprint arrest records. The surprising thing is that there are not more, for crime is on the march, and many of those seven and a half million are hardened, experienced criminals. Every survey made by the Federal Bureau of Investigation shows that not only is crime increasing in every section of the nation, but also that the American criminal is a first-rate opportunist. Let conditions be what they may. Let wars be fought. Let floods and pestilence strike an area. Let the gods bring forth what they will. The criminal will find some way to turn the circumstance to his favor. For that reason, your FBI is especially anxious to bring you tonight's program from the files. For here we uncover a new swindle... A new racket which can be stamped out in only one way, by public recognition. Tonight's file opens in the living room of a small frame house located on the outskirts of a large western city. It is early afternoon, and in the living room, a middle-aged woman in a cotton house dress is talking on the telephone. No, Martha, it's just that I can't stay on the phone very long. I'm expecting my new daughter-in-law, and I have to finish tidying up. Yes, yes, Albert got married just before he went overseas. Mm Mm-hmm. He sent me a picture of her, and from what he wrote to me, she seems to be a very sweet young girl. Yes, yes, she's going to stay with me for a while. Mm Mm-hmm, yes, I did. I have to hang up, Martha. The doorbell just rang. Goodbye. Just a minute. Hello. You're Hazel. Oh, come in, dear. Thanks. My, my, it's good to see you. Albert's written so much about you. I can't tell you how I've been looking forward to this. Thanks. Oh, goodness, I'm not very hospitable, am I? Here, let me have your coat, dear, and put down that bag. I'll bet you're tired after spending all that time on the train. I certainly would be. You'll want to freshen up, so you come with me and I'll show you to your room. Thanks. Now, I want you to remember one thing, dear. This is your home. You're now my daughter. You do whatever you like. Thanks. Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Ira Dixon. Oh, Ira. Hi, Jim. Came by looking for you before, but you were out. I was over at Memorial Hospital taking some testimony from a man who's a patient there. Oh. What'd you want, Jim? Well, New York sent us a flyer on a girl they think might be out here. A girl named Hazel Clinton. Huh? What's the charge? Well, that's a long story. During the war, she married a 19-year-old sailor in South Carolina. 
Uh-huh. That was in 1942. He went overseas shortly after that. She continued to get her allotment checks and the government. Mm-hmm. The next year, his one married a soldier in New Orleans just before he went overseas. She then started to get allotment checks as his wife. I think I know the rest of the story, Jim. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Well, she married four servicemen in all before being taken into custody. She did time. And now she's operating again. That's right. According to the agents who arrested her, Hazel isn't a very bright girl. So I doubt that she thought up the racket she's working now. Uh, what's that, Jim? Well, she's marrying servicemen again, and this time she's swindling their parents. Oh. She works with a confederate, but we can't seem to get a very good description of a partner. How good a description do we have of Hazel Clinton? A complete one, with pictures. Oh, I'm having a new set of flyers printed up on her now. As soon as they're ready, we'll send them out. Come in. Hi, Irene. Hi. How you doing, kid? Oh, swell. The old gal like you? Oh, sure. We're real good pals. You know, Irene, I think she's the nicest mother-in-law I ever had. How oh, she fixed her dough? Well, I guess she's got some. How much can we take her for? Well, she's got 3000 in war bonds. Any jewelry? No. Well, we'll go into action tomorrow morning. I'll write the letter for you now. Okay. We'll ask her for 3000 As soon as we collect, head back to New York. New York? We can't go back to New York, Irene. Why not? We gotta stay here. Why? I gotta wait for Fred. Fred who? You remember Fred. He's the sailor on the battleship. What about him? Well, there was a thing in the paper today. His ship's coming in this week. Well, bully for him. What do you care whether his ship's coming in or not? Because I've got to wait for him. Why? Oh, you silly, don't you know? We're gonna be married. <laughs> Right here, Hazel. Oh, Mom, I got terrible news. Why, what's the matter, dear? This letter, it just came. It's from Albert, and he's in trouble. Is he hurt? No, not that kind of trouble. Oh, what does the letter say? Well, I'll read it to you. Oh. Dear sweetheart, I have only been in Germany a week, and already I'm in such a big trouble that I am not allowed to write and tell you what it is. Oh, good heavens. All I can tell you is that I'm going to be court-martialed next week unless you can help me. But how My can colonel you help says him? that if I give him $3,000, he can see to it that I won't be court-martialed. Oh. That is the only way I can be saved. My poor boy. A captain in the wax who is in my colonel's aid left for the United States yesterday. She oh. will be at the Central Hotel downtown next Thursday. Well, that's today. If you can raise the money, contact her and give her the $3,000. Her name is Captain Kenmore. That is the only way to save me, so please try your hardest to get the money. I am typewriting this letter and not signing my name so that if it is opened by the censors and does not reach you, it will not get my colonel in trouble. Tell Mom I love her and I love you, too. My poor baby. Oh, we got to do something, Mom. I have some war bonds. If I sell them... But, Mom, if you sell them, you'll have nothing left for yourself. Oh, what do I care about myself? So I'll get the bonds and go down to the bank and cash them in right now. Anything coming on the alarm while I was out, Jim? No, Ira, not a thing. You know the difficult deal on these two girls is they never repeat their pattern. Huh? Oh, New York sent out a report on their latest swindle. What did it say? Well, they swindled the mother-in-law this time by telling him that her son was a bigamist. And unless the other woman he had married got some money, the son would go to jail. Hazel's partner was the other woman, of course. Uh, have we got any further description on the partner? No, all we know is that she's a brunette and she's left-handed. Yeah, there's not much to work on. No. How about giving Hazel's picture to newspapers? We may get some results that way. I spoke to the SAC about that, Ira. He's afraid it might scare her off. Oh? Huh? I'll get him. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Oh, hello, Mr. Roberts. Yes, yes, we are. Hmm? Well, he didn't hear anything else, did he? Oh, I see. All right. Thanks very much for calling. We'll get on it right away. Bye. 
I was the head of the special police down at the railroad station, huh? Was some word about Hazel Clinton? Yes, a porter recognized her picture on the flyer and said that he remembered carrying her bag to a taxi cab when she arrived here a couple of days ago. Well, that proves she's in town anyway. He heard her ask the cab driver if he knew the way to Bellwood Avenue, but that's all he heard. Bellwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's on the south side. That's right. All right, well, look, why don't you call the local police down in that precinct? Have them start checking. Okay, Jim. Meanwhile, I'll go down to the railroad station and see if I can find that cab driver. Hi, Irene. Hello, Hazel. Super in that uniform. Where's Mrs. Pomeroy? Oh, she said she had an errand to do and she'd meet us down here. What time she say she'd be here? Oh, at 8 o'clock sharp. Mm. Hope she's on time. Otherwise, I'll be late for my date. Your what? My date. I got a date with Fred. Fred? You know, the sailor I told you about. His ship got in today. When is this date? 8.30. Where? Right here. What? Well, I figured this would be the best place to meet him because we had... You stupid idiot. How could you do this? Do what, Irene? Suppose Mrs. Pomeroy and Fred get here in a dead heat. How will you explain Fred? <laughs> Mrs. Pomeroy is a very understanding woman. Oh, look. How did Fred get in touch with you? He couldn't have known where to call you. Well, I called the Navy Yard and left the message for him. Hazel, how many times have I told you that when Hazel, we're on a job... Hazel, baby! Huh? Oh, Hazel, baby, it's you. Baby, baby, I thought I'd lost you. It's really you. Hazel, break it up. Huh? Oh, uh... Seaman First Class Armstrong, uh, this is Captain Kenmore. Hello, sir. Hello. Hazel, honey, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see you again after all this time. Look, I'll tell you what, baby. Let's make like old times, huh? We'll have a real big night. What do you say? Well... You just wait right here for me. I'm going to register and we'll find some action. I'll be right back. Gee. Hazel. Hazel, what have you been doing? Suppose Mrs. Pomeroy had come in. That would have been a fine picture for her. You and Fred with his arms wrapped around you. Irene... That wasn't Fred. Huh? That was my first husband. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself, I'm on the way up, you know the kind of person we mean. The man who is confident that he will someday come home to his wife with a valentine like this. Helen, come here and kiss the new sales manager of the Acme Company. Meaning me. If this description fits you, if you have plenty of good, solid faith in your future success, then make sure that your life insurance is designed to fit that future. Investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up to people who are confidently looking forward to increased income in the years ahead. This plan offers these three distinct advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second, the equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options which your Equitable Society representative will be glad to explain to you. So, why not get in touch with him? Phone him and ask for full details on the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to the FBI file, The Mother-in-Law Racket. Earlier in 
tonight's program, you heard a recapitulation of some of the crimes which had been committed by the two women we have called Hazel Clinton and Irene Kenmore. That they swindled poor people out of their life savings may have come as something of a shock to you. Possibly it has been your good fortune never to have known people like this. But they nonetheless do exist. And the records of your FBI are filled with the stories of their looting. To criminals, you see, there is no such feeling as compassion. And that so it makes no difference to them whether or not their victim can afford the loss. Nor should it surprise you that both of these criminals are women. For in the last survey, the field of crime made by your FBI, it was shown that in one six-month period last year, more than 37,000 women were arrested. Breaking that figure down, it means that every day, over 200 of the so-called weaker sex were arrested. And the records also show that their offenses covered everything in the statute books. Everything from forgery... To murder. Tonight's file continues in the lobby of the Hotel Central. I tell you, Irene, that wasn't Fred. That was my first husband. What's he doing here? Well, how do I know? Hazel, if we blow this one, I'll murder you. But, Irene, it's not my fault. I, I know, it's my fault. I picked somebody a little smarter to work with instead of hey, a... Hey, look. What? Mrs. Pomeroy just came in the front door. Where? See? She's just inside the door now. Over on the other side by the newsstand. Oh, yeah. The woman in the black hat. Yeah, room. yeah, yeah, I see her. Now, look. You go over at the desk. Get rid of your first husband. Well, how are you going to meet Mrs. Pomeroy? I'll find a way. You just get rid of him. Okay. Good evening. Oh. Are you Mrs. Pomeroy? Yes, I'm Captain Kenmore. Oh, how do you do? Your son showed me your picture. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm very good at remembering faces. My uh, daughter-in-law was supposed to meet me. Yes, she's been here. She just went to the drugstore to get some aspirin. She said she had a very bad headache. Oh. Uh, let's sit over here, Mrs. Conroy. All right. I don't think I have to tell you. No one ought to know about these arrangements except us. I understand that, Captain. Let's sit here. All right. Tell me, Captain, when did you see Albert? The day I left Germany. He was in prison. In prison? Why? He was caught stealing from a quartermaster depot, selling his loot to the black market in Berlin. I can't believe it. He's convicted at the court-martial. Faces a long term in prison. Oh, no. There's only one way to prevent this, Mrs. Pomeroy. I know. I've brought the money. Here. It's all in this envelope. $3,000. I see. Well, Mrs. Pomeroy, you can rest assured now that your son will be cleared. Are you sure? I guarantee it. Thank heaven. Goodness, I... I wonder where my daughter-in-law is. Oh, well, she may be some time. You know, the drugstore is a couple blocks away. Oh. Uh, look, I know this has been a trying experience for you. Why don't you run ahead? Well, I'll I... tell your daughter-in-law that you'll meet her at home. All right, if you'll explain to her. Yes, of course. Thank you again. You're very welcome. Good night. Good night. Hazel. Hazel. Gee, Irene, I've been looking all over the lobby for you. Where'd you go? I closed the deal. Did you get the money? Right here in this envelope. Where's Mrs. Palmer? She went home. Well, you see, everything worked out all right after all. How about your dream boat? Did you get rid of him? Uh-huh. How? Oh. oh, it was easy. I told him that I was in a hurry to get to work. Yeah. And then he asked me what kind of work I did. And when I get home and all that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And then he asked me where he could call me. What'd you tell him? Well, I couldn't think of any other number right there in a hurry, so I gave him Mrs. Pomeroy. <laughs> Mr. Taylor? That's right. I, I presume you're Mrs. Pomeroy. Yes. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Sergeant Goldman of police headquarters called and said you were coming up here. Yes, I went to see him first. 
Right after I got the telephone call from Hazel's other husband. I see. Well, Sergeant Goldman told me about that call, but said that you didn't remember what the man's name was. No, that's right. But he said he was staying at the Hotel Central, if that helps at all. Yes, yes, it should. Tell me, Mrs. Pomeroy, when did you first see Hazel Clinton? Why, nine days ago. She came to my home to live with me. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Nothing until this morning. Then she read me a letter that she said she'd gotten from my son in Germany. Hmm. It said that he was in trouble, but that everything could be fixed up for $3,000. Have you got that letter? I know, sir. She kept it. Hmm. What was the next step, Mrs. Pomeroy? At 8 o'clock tonight, I went to the lobby of the Hotel Central and gave a woman named Captain Kenmore the money. Do you think you'd recognize this woman if you ever saw her again? Yes, I think so. Good. I just received pictures of three women from our general appearance file in Washington. They suspect that one of these is a Confederate. Here are the pictures, Mr. Pomeroy. Now, will you please look at these very carefully? I will. This is the woman, Mr. Taylor. This one here. Oh. Good. Now, let's see what it says about her. Five feet, five inches tall, dark hair. Weight, 110 pounds. Remarks. She is left-handed. Can you get my money back for me, Mr. Taylor? It's all I have. We'll try our best, Mrs. Pomeroy. Well, now I think the first thing for me to do is go down to the Hotel Central and try to locate the man who called you. Hazel, quit doing your nails and listen. I'm not interested. Oh, stop pouting. We got what we came to this town for. Not everything. What do you mean? I haven't got Fred. You wouldn't let me wait in the lobby when we were over at the Hotel Central, and now maybe you'll never find me. Honey, guys like Fred grow on trees. Matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they live in them. Very funny. Well, did you want to stick around and run into your first husband again? No, but I'd like to run into Fred... I could call the Navy Yard and tell him to tell Fred that I'll be waiting in the lobby of this hotel instead. You're not going to call the Navy Yard. Well, I don't see why not. Because the cops might be looking for us by this time. Well, then I'll call the Navy Yard and leave a fake name. Yeah, if you leave a fake name, how's Fred going to know it's you? Oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Hazel, look, we've got $3,000. We're going back to New York and work our way west again. Well, okay. But I hate to miss Fred. He always wanted to marry me, and after all, R Irene, I haven't been married to anybody in almost six months. Okay, wait a minute. Mr. Armstrong? That's right. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. Okay. What do you want with me? I'd like to ask you a few questions. May I come in? Sure. Come on. Thanks. I'm checking all the servicemen who are staying in the hotel, Mr. Armstrong. We're looking for a young lady. So am I. Oh. Well, I've got her picture here. Will you take a look at this, please? What are you doing with my wife's picture? Well, I'm sorry to have to tell it to you in this way, Mr. Armstrong, but she's also the wife of six other servicemen that we know about. What? That's right. This girl is a swindler. Now, I understand you called a Mrs. Pomeroy earlier tonight. Is that correct? Yeah. Who is she? She's another of Hazel's mother-in-laws. Tell me, how did you happen to call her? Uh, where did you get the number? From Hazel. She wrote it down for me. Good. That's what I was hoping. What did she write it on? The inside of that book of matches. What? Over by the phone. Oh. Please? Yeah. You mind if I take them along with me? No. Thanks very much, Mr. Armstrong. I'll be in touch with you. Now loading at gate six. Irene, 
Is that our plane? No, and where have you been? Oh, just outside that door. What's playing out there? Well, did you look around you while we were on that bus coming out here? Uh Uh-huh. Well, didn't you see that sailor sitting in back of us? Hazel, do me a favor, will you? Go in the wagon. What do you mean? Oh, never mind. Oh, but Irene, he comes from Denver, and he's already invited me to come and meet his folks. Irene, can we switch our tickets and go to Denver with him? No, it's too late. He'll be calling our plane any minute. Well, should I go back and ask the sailor if he wants to switch his tickets and go to New York with us? No. Can't you stand still and be quiet for a couple of minutes? You want a stick of gum? No. Hey. What? I wonder what happened to my first husband. I'll look in my crystal ball and let you know. That's our plane, Hazel. Okay. Come on. Just a minute, young ladies. I beg your pardon. Oh, I'm sorry, mister. We're in a hurry. We've got to make that plane. I wouldn't worry about that. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Huh? I've got a warrant here for your arrest. <laughs> Irene Kenmore and Hazel Clinton were each given five-year sentences in a federal court for a violation of the Servicemen's Dependents Allowance Act. The money they took from their victim, Mrs. Pomeroy, was recovered and returned to her. In examining the match cover on which Hazel Clinton had written the telephone number of Mrs. Pomeroy, Special Agent Taylor noticed that the matches which had been used were torn from the left side of the book which is the habit of left-handed people. He remembered that Irene Kenmore was left-handed and that that part of the pattern was that she stayed at a hotel while Hazel stayed with her pseudo-mother-in-law. The cover of the book of matches showed that they were from the Hotel Imperial and a call by Special Agent Taylor to the hotel told him that a woman answering the description of Irene Kenmore had just checked out. A transportation desk at the Hotel Imperial then revealed that Miss Kenmore had purchased two airplane tickets to New York. In that way, two special agents, aided by cooperation from the local police and from the New York field office, were able to apprehend the two criminals in tonight's case, to close their criminal careers, and to put an end to their racket. just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Not long ago, an executive of the Equitable Life Assurance Society made a very thought-provoking remark. He said, You can take the successful men of tomorrow by the life insurance they buy today. What he meant was simply this. Let's assume that you are interested in the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Well... The fact that you are interested is first-rate evidence that you actually are the type of man who's headed for success. If you check with that thought, then you'll decide now to ask your equitable representative for full information on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A story describing a daring crime on the high seas. Its subject, jewel theft. Its title, The Five Fathom Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time 
when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Five Fathom Frame-Up on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.